Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Curtis Dubay. I'm the Senior Tax Policy Analyst at the Heritage Foundation. We're here today to talk about the Marketplace Fairness Act, or as I like to call it, the misnamed Marketplace Fairness Act. This bill passed the Senate earlier this month, and it now awaits action in the House. What the Marketplace Fairness Act would do is it would allow states to enforce their sales taxes on out-of-state online retailers with more than a million dollars of online sales. Uh, right now, states cannot force these businesses to collect their sales tax. States can only force businesses that have a physical presence within their borders to do so. Physical presence is usually established with a store, a plant, or a warehouse. The Marketplace Fairness Act would overturn that physical presence standard. It was set more than 20 years ago by the Supreme Court in, what's in the Quill decision. Uh, even though it was set during a time of catalog mail order sales, that presence still holds up uh, in the internet age. Because by allowing states to enforce their sales tax rules and regulations beyond their borders, it would violate federalism. The businesses, these small online businesses that would have to uh, follow the rules and regulations of 46 different states' uh, sales, uh, sales taxes uh, have, no political, have no access to the political system that sets those rules and regulations. So it would end up being taxation and regulation without representation. And a, a selling point of those in favor of the Marketplace Fairness Act is that it would level the playing field between traditional brick and mortar stores and online retailers. However, that's not quite the case. If the Marketplace Fairness Act passes, traditional brick and mortar sellers will continue collecting sales taxes where they are physically present, just like they're doing today. It's the online retailers who will now be on the hook for collecting sales taxes in the approximately 10,000 jurisdictions where their customers are located. That is not an equal burden, and that is not fair. So these are the reasons why we at the Heritage Foundation believe the Marketplace Fairness Act is bad policy. Uh, to give a deeper background on the Marketplace Fairness Act and why they believe it's bad policy, we have with us today two experts on internet sales taxes. Uh, Katie McAuliffe is the Federal Affairs Manager at Americans for Tax Reform. ATR is the leading group fighting against tax increases at the federal and state levels. Katie is an expert on, inter on telecom issues. We al also have Carl Zabo, Policy Counsel at NetChoice. NetChoice is dedicated to preventing the unduly burdensome regulations on the internet and maintaining the free flow of e-commerce. Carl is an expert in communications and internet policy. I'm going to ask Katie and Carl a series of questions to guide our discussion today, and we'll save plenty of time at the end for questions from the audience. We are recording today's event, so if you miss anything, you'll be able to view it later on on our blog, which you can find at www.heritage.org. Please distribute the video widely to those who were not able to attend today. So with that, I'll kick it off with the first question. Katie and Carl, where did the Marketplace Fairness Act come from? Why are we here today? Why was this recently pushed through the Senate? And why do you think it's bad policy? Well, Curtis, for over a decade, the states have worked through the streamlined sales tax process to simplify their sales tax to the point where it's so simple that it doesn't create an undue burden on out-of-state commerce. The Supreme Court back in Quill looked at the complexity of the 7,500 different tax jurisdictions at that time and said, whoa, 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 this is way too complicated to impose on out-of-state companies. So at the early 2000s, late 90s, states got together and they started to sit down and try to simplify their tax code. You'd think it would be as simple as one rate per state, but it's unfortunately not that simple. They tried to have one set of definitions. So if you're buying candy, you're buying a candy bar in one state, it counts as candy. But in another state, it does not count as food, subject to two different tax rates based on which state is collecting. So states have worked on this for over a decade. And unfortunately, they weren't getting too much traction in Congress or even amongst themselves to create a unified set of rules and regulations. Well, about four or five years ago, the big box stores, Walmart, Target, Best Buy, got into the fight. They were getting beat by their online competitor, Amazon, and decided that one of the ways to get at Amazon is through an increase in taxes. So the big box stores then began spending millions and millions of dollars in lobbying, advertising, 
and trying to push these bills through Congress. And that's why you've only started to really hear about it in the past couple of years. Now, one of the things Curtis brought up was, in 1993, he mentioned this Supreme Court decision called Quill. And if you work on this, you're going to hear the word Quill kind of thrown about, the Quill decision, Quill standard. Well, Quill is a catalog company. In fact, they sell office supplies today. You may find many of them in, in your office. I got a, got a box from uh, Quill the other day. Well, Quill's a catalog seller. And so back in 93, it was too complicated to require Quill, the catalog seller, to collect sales tax for any state where they didn't have physical presence. Today, catalog sales still make up more sales than internet sales. I know, it sounds surprising. They're often forgot about in this discussion. But there are a lot of catalog sales, a lot of catalog sellers still out there. So that problem or issue remains the same as it was back in 93. So why did the big box stores start getting involved? Well, because Amazon has now become a big player. And that's why you've seen such a big push to get this through Congress, and you've seen all the ads in all the magazines. So as we go forward, you're going to see only an increase in pressure and an increase in spending from the big box stores who have millions and millions of dollars to spend on this and have been able to convince many of us to see this as internet versus Main Street. Because the fact that it's now the big box stores who've often been the enemy of Main Street, leading the charge and spending the millions of dollars, I have to wonder, is this really helping Main Street or is it just helping them? Well, you know, it's not, it's not internet versus Main Street. We're talking about small businesses everywhere. These are small businesses that are brick and mortar. These are small businesses that are online. They should really be working together. Um, if you saw today in Politico, the E-Main Street Alliance just put out a letter talking about the major problems and how they believe that they really are on the same footing and that they really should be working together in this because they're small businesses. They operate under what the small business says. What is it? Three million? Up higher? 250? Yeah. 250. So under, two, under the 250 threshold. I mean, these are businesses that are growing our economy. They're very important. Why do we want to put taxes on economic growth? Why do we want to tax the one place where you can really have a lot of free market, low barriers to entry? And again, we'll get into later, like there are different problems that online businesses face that are comparable because you have different business models. And, and Katie does bring up a really good point. The Main Street stores embrace the online sales platform. Mm -hmm. So my mother sells custom-made jewelry, for example. She goes around to different craft shows, but she can only see the people who walk by her booth or who call her on the phone. But she can set up a website, and now suddenly she has access to customers in 50 states for custom jewelry, unique items, who otherwise would never go to her shows, never call her on the phone. So it's a great opportunity for small stores to suddenly expand their customer base. Because as we see fewer and fewer people going to the actual main streets, instead going to their one-stop shops, these main street stores now have a new way to get people to see their wares. So, so uh, there's a, this perception out there that right now that all online purchases are tax-free. Uh, explain how. What do you think about that? Is that true? Do you, are all online sales tax-free right now? No, they aren't. So if you're located in a state or if you're located in multiple states, you pay sales tax for people who purchase within the state. So I'm in Virginia. I've got a business, and a Virginian purchases from me. They pay sales tax, and I remit that to the state. I'm the business. I collect it. I'm the tax collector. I send it back to the tax authority. If I have a warehouse in Tennessee and someone from Tennessee purchases something from me, then that person... Um, I collect sales tax for them and remit it to Tennessee. So in these ways, they are collecting sales tax. They're benefiting from being there. You know, small businesses that are growing online aspire to be bigger stores. And when they expand and move into other states, they need new distribution centers. They need sales reps to go across borders. They're happy to pay sales taxes for where they're operating because they're growing and expanding. But where they are right now, this is a barrier to entry, a tax on economic growth that they really can't withstand. And, and Katie brings up a really good point. Any store that has physical presence in your state will collect for every sale you make. 
Now, just to give you a couple examples that you might think about. If I were to go right now to target.com and place an order for shipment to my house here in DC, target.com will collect sales tax because there's a Target store up in Columbia Heights. And that gives Target a real benefit because I can buy the product and then decide, well, if I don't like it, I can just go up to Columbia Heights and return the item. I can buy the item, and if it breaks, I can make an exchange in store. So it gives Target a real benefit to have that physical presence here in DC, even if they are collecting sales tax for DC. For those of you who live in Virginia, you'll notice that Amazon will start collecting sales tax this upcoming September. That's because they decided to open a distribution center in Virginia and made a deal with the state for economic incentives in exchange for beginning to collect starting September. And that's the establishment of physical presence by Amazon in the state of Virginia. Why did Virginia do, why did Amazon do this? Well, because by opening a store in Virginia, they can now offer same day delivery of many of the items that you wanna buy online. And they're opening distribution centers all across the country. Amazon now collects for over half the population in the US because they've opened so many distribution centers across the country and they've opened many different stores and warehouses. Right, and because of this, you know, states really aren't losing out on that much collection of revenue. I mean, in the top 10 online retailers, most of them are stores with physical presence and nearly are in all 50 states. They do collect sales tax. We're looking at about 85% of sales taxes collected and remitted to the states. So, you know, what are we really going after here? There's not that much revenue to go around, and it certainly is not going to pay for this quote-unquote free software. But, Katie, I, I thought states were starving for money, and this is going to be the fix. This is going to get us out of our economic problem, because that's some of the things that, that have been said. I, I think you might be talking about budgeting. <laughs> well, exactly. And, and as you said, it's not even that much revenue. It's not some silver bullet that states are suddenly going to be able to turn on and have an economic recovery. It's a very small amount of money, and that pool of money is getting ever smaller as the biggest online e-retailer, which is Amazon, is opening more and more distribution centers across the country and is collecting for more and more of the population. Katie, Katie alluded to a comment. As it stands right now, nine of the top 10 e-retailers collect for 100% of the country. The remaining one, Amazon collects for half of it. 17 of the top 20 already collect for 100% of the country. Many of these top e-retailers are stores you'll recognize. Target.com, Best Buy.com, Apple.com, Walmart.com. Stores of physical presence, distribution centers, and are already collecting for most all of the country. Yeah, and that's important to point out, but the states are still in favor of this, right? They still, for the most part, states want to see this pass. Governors, state legislators. Yes, and you know, they want to see this passed. Not because, we're talking about how small the revenue is, right? They don't want it passed because they want sales tax revenue. They want to set a precedent. So we're moving down the road here and say I'm a you know, successful Virginia business and 10% of my sales are going to California. California is tracking me. I'm over this million dollar threshold and I've been remitting sales tax to them because the Marketplace Unfairness Act passed. And so you know, you're moving on and California's like, hey, you know, 10% of your business activity goes to California. So we're gonna start taxing that too. So you've got a slippery slope. You're setting a precedent to start taxing other activities. You're breaking down states' borders. You're breaking down federalism. And that's not even speaking to the states who have chosen not to have a sales tax. So you're looking at states who don't have a sales tax. They've decided to you know, have their budget balanced elsewhere and go that route. And now these businesses are suddenly subject to 45 different states with different audits, and they have to remit to those, and this is incredibly burdensome on them. And we'll get into why in just a little bit. Yeah. So you, you got into a little bit of the history of where this kind of evolved uh, going back to since the cool decision, but uh, what is the perceived problem the bill supposedly addresses? So what is, the, what is the argument that the backers of the bill make in terms of the leveling the playing field between brick and mortar sellers and online retailers? So. You'll, you'll hear this a lot, that somebody goes into a store, they look at a pair of shoes, and then they go and buy it online because there's no sales tax. 
This example has been brought up time and time again. It's called showrooming. Well, National Journal published this PricewaterhouseCoopers study done, uh, done at the beginning of January. It found that this really only happens about 2% of the time, where people go into a store, see an item, and then go buy it online because of uh, no sales tax collection. And let, let's just think about it in our own day-to-day -day lives. One of the examples uh, Senator Durbin brought up was the example of a shoe store. How many of us go into a shoe store, try on a pair of shoes, because we've got a race coming up, or we've got an event that we have to attend, and then go home and buy it online? Nobody really does that. There are a couple who are really obsessed with maybe saving a couple of pennies, but the sheer convenience of having that pair of shoes on your feet when you walk out of the store, that's really satisfying. That's really convenient. And that makes life a lot easier. And you know that if you take those sho shoes home, and they cause you a lot of pain, turmoil, it's easy to go back to that store and return them. It's a real pain to try to return it online. You have to wait in line at the post office. You have to pay shipping. So even if there is that sales tax differential, the convenience and the cost get eaten up real quickly. I mean, I know that if I'm going to buy a new hard drive or some kind of electronic, I go online, I look it up, I get the information, I look at the reviews, and then I go to the store and buy it because they don't want to have to ask someone else in the store what I'm buying. Like, I want to re research that on my own, but I want it now. And so that, I mean, that's what I do personally, so that's just one case, but I don't think I'm alone. And this National Journal study shows that, you know, 23% of people that they talk to do this. Yeah, they, they go online, they do the research, then they go buy it in stores. And there Mo are 2% that buy in stores. I don't know where the gap is there, but. Yeah, and, and so Mother's Day was a couple weeks ago. Jewelry, a very high-ticket item which you would think to avoid paying sales tax, people would just go and buy it online. But my wife is very particular. She is a very picky lady. And if I pick out the wrong piece of jewelry, she sounds unique. She sure as heck wants to be able to return that item. And so I went down to my local store, Boone and Sons, over on Connecticut Avenue, and I bought that item in the store because they've got great customer service. I can touch it, I can feel it, I can actually see what a carat diamond actually looks like, which is surprisingly small. And I know that if she hates this item, they'll take it back, no questions asked. So even big high ticket items like that, I will go buy in store because of the sheer convenience and the ability to touch and feel the items. So that's one of the arguments that's been throwing, thrown around is that people go into stores, see the prices and go buy it online. I'm not saying it never happens, it does. And if people want to avoid paying sales tax, they'll find a way but it's not the big problem that you've been led to believe it is. And that's the argument about this inequality or this unfairness. The Main Street stores just can't compete with the sales tax differential. One of the other things is Amazon recently began collecting in California. They collect sales tax this past September. Amazon reported the highest sales and largest growth that they've seen in the state of California. If sales tax is the determining factor for why people buy online, those numbers should have gone down, not gone up. And so just looking at California, you can see that maybe people don't buy online because of sales tax. They do it for price, and they do it for convenience, and they do it because they don't have time in their daily jobs to go out to the store. So if the Marketplace Fairness Act became law, what kind of burden are we talking about being placed on the online businesses that would be affected by the bill? Well, we can start with, I don't know, do we want to start with audits? Let's start with audits. <laughs> so, I mean, when you're looking at having to, being a small business and having to remit to 45 different states, um, you're looking at a lot of complexity. And with the recent overreaches that we've already seen from the IRS, why wouldn't we believe that states would do the same thing? I mean, you're looking at them being exposed to a number of different audits from different states where they have different codes for different products that the businesses do have to deal with. So, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm a, again, Virginia business, well, close to Virginia, so that's easy for me. So Virginia business, I sell into New York. The New York uh, State Department of Revenue comes back and they say, hey, we think you screwed up. We're going to audit you. We're going to take you to court. We're going to impose a tax lien. There's nothing Virginia can do to protect me from that. And the business is open to that from all 45 states. 
And it's been estimated that there are maybe um, 7,500 businesses that are over this million dollar threshold. So that's a really small pool. And if you've got 45 states and some of them um, have some budget issues and they're looking for someone to go after, why wouldn't this small pool get targeted more often? I mean, you can make, you can make that association that they would get targeted more often for audits. You want to throw anything about audits? Yeah, and, and so Katie mentions that they would create a lien or they, they would uh, force you to go to court. But one of the important things to remember is the MFA does nothing to allow you to challenge that out-of-state auditor in your own home court. So my mom, who runs her online business in Maryland, could get a letter from California. And it costs nothing to generate a, a demand email from an auditor in California. They hit a button, boom, my mom gets a, an email that says, you owe $50 in tax. My mom is way below the $1 million seller threshold. She wants to be above it, but it's going to take a while. So she has two choices. Either one, pay the $50 that California says she owes, or two, buy a ticket, get on a plane, hire a lawyer, fly out to California, and challenge that tax collector in a California court. Like anyone who's ever gotten a ticket from the D.C. government, you know you just pay it. You don't waste your time, you don't waste your money, you don't waste your energy trying to fight it in court, you just pay it. And so that's the thing, these tax collectors can get very, very aggressive. They can send out mil hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of demand emails and every one of these online businesses has two choices, pay it or spend the time and money to fight it. And most of us are just gonna pay it. Well, and you know, going off of that, one of the things that I wanna get into is talking about software. So software is suddenly a panacea. Um, if you got some free software, we all know that free software works really well the first time you try it out. Ask some people who did a beta test the day that it was really important. And so, you know, you're using this software to collect, but the software that you get for free is only from your own state, and it only has those codes programmed in. So the businesses themselves have to go back in and program all the different codes for the different states. Now, if you know, when you look at the varying ways that things are taxed, in Wisconsin, there are flagpole taxes. So if you buy a flag by itself, it's taxed one way. But if you buy a flag and it's attached to a pole, it's taxed another way. And if you buy it on a certain day, then it's not taxed at all. I mean, these kinds of things go through. You can look at the way ice cream cakes are made. Or a candy bar is sometimes it's food, sometimes it's, I'm sorry, a granola bar. Sometimes it's food, sometimes it's candy. So there are all these different complicated things. And the retailers, or the online retailers, would actually have to code them this themselves. Also, you're looking at new training for the people who have to use the programs. So that's going to take hours. You're looking at other costs that go along with software. This includes mapping and integration. One of the things that the small businesses talk about is that they have different shopping carts that they're integrated with. And on different platforms, you have to have a certain type of software to do this. And some of these softwares are very expensive, and I don't expect that states can afford these types of software to give to the small number of businesses in order to do this. It's not actually a solution. And, and one of the things with respect to the free software you're given, there's a provision in the MFA that says, if the software fails, you, the business, are not liable for that failure. But that's only if the software itself fails. If during the integration of one of the 46 different pieces of state software, you, as a business, make an error, you are still liable. Because the software didn't fail, your ability to integrate the 46 different pieces of software is where the failure occurred. So there's a provision that sometimes the other side will say, supporters of the bill will say, well, that's okay if you, if you don't collect the right amount of tax because there's a safe harbor. But that safe harbor only exists if the software is the one who fails, not if one of your integrations is the cause of the failure. Sure. Yeah, and so that's the big push on the other side saying, well, we get provide the software. It's not a big burden for the uh, small online retailers. Well, but it's a financial by. burden, too. It's not free. So in the, the letter that um, was on the table, if you grabbed it from the E-Main Street Alliance, they say that in the first year of the law, integration compliance and remittance costs for businesses fall between $20,000 and $300,000.
It's not free software. When you look at all the aspects that go along with software integration, maintenance, training, and a lot of these businesses, maybe they're over the million dollar threshold, but their profit margins are not a million dollars. We're not talking about their profits, we're talking about their sales. So when you look at that, I mean, they've estimated they could lose 220,000 jobs because of these initial compliance costs. Right, and so when, when you, once you get the software set up, you still have to then collect the right tax, fill out the 46 different forms, remit them, and then you're still subject to the audits. They said that, well, the software will eliminate the audit problem. Well, no, if you make a, pro if you make a mistake, or they think you made a mistake after you've implemented the software and gotten the right tax collected, say in remittance, you're still subject to the audit. Well, and you know, you talk about, okay, so only over a million dollars you're gonna get audited. How are they gonna find out if you're over a million dollars? They're gonna have to audit you. If you're right on that, that threshold right there, you have to prove that, hey, I'm not over a million dollars or prove that, hey, I am over a million dollars. So what we're doing is setting up a barrier for businesses to grow. If you're under a million dollars, why would you want to grow your business even more if you're gonna run into an additional taxes credits that would actually reduce the profitability of your business? And one of the things that Curtis mentioned at the beginning was the Quill catalog. And catalog sellers are completely forgotten in this discussion. It's all about internet. It's all about internet, <laughs> internet. And to be honest, I'm somewhat guilty of it. It wasn't until about a year ago that the American Catalog Mailers Association came knocking on our door and said, hey, we're gonna be hit by the MFA as well because they're an out-of-state seller. The MFA doesn't say if you do sales online, it says if you do sales from out-of-state. So, as I mentioned earlier, catalog sales are still a big, big business. The New York Times said it's $22 billion of uncollected sales tax, 11 billion of which comes from catalogs. Catalog sellers are a majority of the elderly. And I know many of us, some of the people in the room may have never actually filled out a catalog or have not looked at a catalog recently, but when you open it up, there's a page in the middle where you put in your order and at the bottom, there's a little line that says, if you live in, let's say, Ohio, because that's where the catalog mailer is based. If you live in Ohio, add 6% for the sales tax. Well, that's fine if you live in Ohio. The cataloger can do and add on that one little line. People filling out checks, sending, putting on credit card numbers, if they get it wrong, that company can kind of eat the difference because it's not really worth it. So one of the catalogers, uh, Amerimark, is a catalog company in Ohio, decided we're gonna take a look to see what would happen if we had to actually implement MFA. And instead of just having collect for Ohio 6%, we had to collect for each one of the 9,600 different tax jurisdictions and recognize the different sales tax holidays. And they came up with this insert that would uh, go in. <laughs> and uh, this is, this is double-sided and it's somewhat incomplete, but I, I, would, I, I would ask you to think about, uh, you know, somebody who's elderly trying to buy a hearing aid or something like that, and <laughs> let's say they live in Colorado. Well, they have to figure out which city in Colorado, then there's a, an exception uh, for a sales tax holiday, or they fill, figure out if it's medical, medical equipment. What so, happens if I broke my bifocals? Exactly. So, so there are a lot of problems. Now, of course, this is demonstrative. Catalog companies pr you know, probably wouldn't be doing inserts that are larger than the catalog itself. But at the same time, they would have to figure out a way to make those sales tax collections possible. And so they would have to start doing custom printing for each locality, for each one of the 9,600 different jurisdictions. They would have to do custom tax printing. Well, how do they make up for those costs? They get passed down to those consumers. And as I said, it's a majority of those over the age of 50 are still shopping exclusively by catalog. So those increased costs ultimately get passed down to them. So as you go forward, speaking on behalf of Trust, which is a true simplification of taxation coalition, which is also a group formed to oppose the MFA, I ask that you think about catalogers as well as internet sales, because I know we live in DC and it's all about the internet right now, but a lot of the constituents in your members' districts still order by catalog, and before you start passing laws that would impact them, you should maybe ask them what they would feel about this.
So, uh, Katie, you, you sent a letter to Senators Enzi and Alexander a few weeks back, and one of the issues you brought up is um, whether the Marketplace Fairness Act settles for once and all the nexus question. Uh, can you explain a little bit about that? Does it, or is nexus now going to, if, if MFA becomes law, is nexus set in stone? Do we have a set definition of it? Um, <laughs> um, so the physical presence standard is the clearest definition of nexus. When you're going into um, the Marketplace Fairness Act, and you get down to the last page, there's this nice section there called Section 6. And Section 6 states, this act shall not be construed to preempt or limit any power exercised or to be exercised by a state or local jurisdiction under the law of such state or local jurisdiction or under any other federal law. The problem with this one sentence, this one small section, is that it means that the MFA is not really the law of the land. It means that states can still start writing um, laws and pursue nexus in their own way. They don't have to subscribe to the MFA. They don't have to subscribe to um, the minimum simplification requirements in that or in the streamlined sales tax and use agreement. They can continue to say, ah, you're an affiliate marketer. We think that's nexus and we're going to tax you. Um, we're going to use our, our rounding rules, you know, these kinds of things, other types of presence. So it doesn't necessarily say that the MFA is how you're going to collect sales tax. So you can still be dealing, and also if they're not doing the MFA, they can ignore the million dollar exception. And we also think that this could mean that states, especially if you look at some place like California that can go back six years in audits, that once they have the information from online sellers, can go and say to their citizens, you know, you owe us this much money in use tax which I don't think many people would be very happy about going retroactively. And I don't think that's the intention, or that would, I would hope that's not the intent. Maybe I'm being nice. And, and Katie brings up a good point about the slippery slope problem. Now, I, I did spend the last two minutes talking about catalogs, but I am going to go back to the internet. And one of the cool things about the internet right now is digital services. Many of us in this room have Dropbox accounts or SugarSync accounts or stream movies online from various services. Well, if MFA passes, it just takes a small tweak in a state's tax code suddenly demand that Dropbox begin collecting sales tax for their services. Or it just takes a small tweak suddenly demand that the apps that you're buying and installing on your cell phones are now subject to sales tax. It opens up a real opportunity for digital goods, ebooks, and digital services to now become subject to new tax authorities by different states, even if they don't have any physical presence in that state whatsoever. So we've talked a lot about the burden this would put on businesses, the online businesses that would now have to collect in 10,000 jurisdictions around the country. Uh, and remit to 46 different states, and the, and the fact that the software does absolutely nothing to alleviate their burden. What about Americans that shop online? How is this going to impact them? There's a lot of talk you'll hear that this isn't really a tax increase. Uh, what, what do you think about that? Is this a tax increase, and what, what do you think is going to happen to those online, um, excuse me, online shoppers? So, um, if you, as an elected official, vote in favor of a legislation and people see their taxes go up, it's hard to look at your constituents and say, I never voted for a tax increase. I mean, that's the conversation that goes on between an elected official and their constituents. It's, you know, because it's, oh, well, we gave federal authority for this, and the states say, oh, well, you know, they just said we could do it, so we're doing this now, doesn't mean that people don't see their taxes go up. So if semantically, someone wants to claim that there's not a tax increase, that's a discussion that they have to have with their constituents. But I don't think if you run across a fact-checking organization, newspaper, anyone who's going to say that your taxes didn't go up. And, and it's also a new tax burden on those businesses. Mm -hmm. So right now, an out-of-state seller does not have to collect and remit sales tax for any place they don't have physical presence. If MFA gets passed, suddenly they do. And it's the business that ultimately owes those taxes when the auditor comes a knock in. The analogy I like to think about is if I lend my car to my friend and he get, hits a red light camera, I'm the one who ultimately has to pay that ticket, whether I get the money out of my friend or not. 
Same thing's true for an online seller if MFA passes. They're the ones who ultimately have to pay these new taxes, whether they collect the money or not. And of course, they will find a way to collect that money. It may not be explicitly through taxes on the end of the order form, but they're going to have to increase prices. They're going to have to increase cost to consumers. And they're going to have to force the constituents in your districts to pay more money. And that's essentially what we're trying to pass here, is an opportunity for your constituents to pay more money for the services they now enjoy. Yeah, and I think I try to use a pretty common sense approach to these questions. Are you going to be paying more in taxes if this bill passes? And there's no doubt you're going to be paying more in taxes. This came up a lot in the, the fiscal cliff negotiations and the debate leading up the expiration of the Bush tax cuts. There, a lot of people always would say that, well, this isn't a tax increase because it, the, the, the tax cuts were always scheduled, legislated to, to expire. Well, think about it from the taxpayer's perspective. In 2012, you're paying a certain amount of tax. In 2013, you're going to be paying more. That's a tax increase. And it's very hard, like you said, to look at your constituents and say, well, I didn't vote for a tax increase when they obviously are paying more than they were before. Well, and if you subscribe to the claim that it's $23 billion in new revenue, where does the new revenue come from? Right. And that, so there's all, I think also that gets missed in this debate is that the money is coming from the residents of the state. They're not taxing online businesses. The, the tax gets passed forward to customers. So they're looking for ways to get online retailers to be tax collectors for them to collect taxes from their own residents. The money's coming out of the pockets of their own residents. Uh, so last question before we go to question and answer. Um, there's a lot of debate going back and forth that basically the Marketplace Fairness Act is a conservative approach to the issue. Uh, I'm curious to get your take on that. Is this a, is this a, is this a conservative bill? And then secondly, this has kind of been rushed through the Senate all of a sudden. This has been an issue that's been kind of batted around for years, but why at this time was it rushed through uh, a few weeks ago, and why is there a big push being put forward to get it passed into law now? Well, Curtis, if you look at the vote that came out of the Senate, no Republican under the age of 50 voted for that bill. Zero. And a majority of Republicans voted against it. Now, as you're well aware, the Senate is, you know, highly Democratic, and so that's why the vote turned out the way it did. But just remember that. Zero Republicans under the age of 50 voted in favor of this bill. So I really do have to ask if this is a Republican ag agenda bill, or if it's just been really well packaged, really well advertised, and great kudos to the PR department that came up with the name Marketplace <laughs> Fairness Act. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree. I don't think it's, I, I don't, I don't agree with the bill. Um, I'm a conservative, so I don't think it's a conservative bill. There are a number of other conservative organizations who, a large number of conservative organizations who have spoken out against this bill very, very strongly. Um, Andrew Moreland of R Street just had a wonderful article, if you missed it. Um, Face Palm is somewhere in the title, and it's pretty awesome. So there, I mean, there are a lot of discussions of, that go back and forth as to what this is and what this isn't. And you know, if we're talking about federalism, the best way to respect states' rights is to not let them reach across their borders. And, and you asked about getting rushed through. One of the handouts we had on the table out there has a moniker at the top that reads TRUST, T-R-U-S-T. It has a list of minimum simplifications, things that had been in the work in Streamline but have been completely discarded as this bill has been shrunk down, mm -hmm. narrowed, and made it real easy to get passed. And to right, really I think you be- you meant expanded. Right, and, and to be really palatable or even considered, all of those minimum simplifications really need to be in there. Stuff as simple as the issue we brought up. One audit, you're subject to one audit, and that's an auditor from your home state, so you can actually challenge it. Very simple. Second, if states are going to provide free software, it has to cover sales tax in all of the states, not just your own state. That way a company can integrate one piece of software, not 46. So I encourage you to take a look at that sheet. It runs down a list of 12 very reasonable requirements and then shows how MFA stacks up against it or, in this case, does not stack up against it. All right, well, uh, I think we can open it up to question and answers from the audience now. Uh, if, you, if you have a question, raise your hand. I'll call on you. Please state your name and your affiliation. Uh, Brandon Arnold from National Taxpayers Union. I'm wondering uh, how this bill deals with international 
additional sales. My understanding is that there's really no provisions dealing with that. So wouldn't that incentivize businesses that are getting beaten over the head with, uh, with this new law uh, to relocate to Canada or Bermuda or wherever? Sure. I mean, especially, you know, if you're someplace that's close to the border and you want to just jump over to Canada or um, locate your business there, you wouldn't be dealing with sales tax collection. Um, and that, that could be an incentive. And, and for those of us who watched the, the Senate hearings on this, you heard the, represent, the senator from North Dakota claiming, well, I've gone after businesses in Canada and I've gotten them to remit their, their taxes. Well, that's because those businesses in Canada were voluntary enough to remit those taxes. MFA gives, does not give states the power to reach across international borders. So North Dakota can ask a Canadian business to turn over sales tax, but it can't force a Canadian business to turn over their sales tax. And nothing in, in MFA gives North Dakota that power. Thanks. Uh, next question. not just the 45 to 46 states and the territories, but also those Indian tribe uh, audits on that. And then my question is, um, how does MFA, how, how do you think it encourages businesses like your mom's uh, jewelry uh, business to use their platform? And like, is, is there basically an incentive now for your mom to join a bigger internet retailer or a big box store with a website? Do, is there other incentives in place for that? And what happens with, with her software? Now that she's on Amazon's uh, 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 platform, can she still use that software, this tax collection software, for her own business? So a number of businesses sell both through their own websites and on large platforms like Amazon.com. And Amazon.com has been really great for some of these businesses to get some good exposure. Silver Gallery Jewelry is not my mom's jewelry store, but it's another jewelry store down in, down in Virginia. They sell both, they have a brick and mortar on Main Street, They've got a website and they sell online through Amazon. The problem with their sales on Amazon is they actually take a loss on each one of those sales because their margins are so small. Amazon will take between 12 and 20% of the sales. So if you're operating on a 10% margin where you're selling a $90, you buy an item for 90, you sell it for 100, you sell it on Amazon, you might actually be selling it at a loss. Why does Silver Gallery do this? Because they hope that by getting the exposure on Amazon.com, people will then begin going to their Main Street store or their website. Well, Paul Meisner from Amazon during a Senate hearing said, you know what, we will help out all these stores that are now subject to MFA. We will, help, we will take care of all the sales tax collection and only do it for 2 or 3% of the cost. And that's really nice. But what was left out of Mr. Meisner's statement is that's 2 and 3% on top of the 20% that they're already collecting. So if you're a business and MFA passes and you don't sell on Amazon, you have your own website, you're suddenly looking at 23% of your sales going to Amazon. I appreciate that Amazon is offering this service, and you know what? They've created a really great business model and a great website. But I don't think it's fair to force my mom's business to suddenly begin turning over 25% of her revenue to Amazon. Give it to Dad, Katie. Sir. Right. Well, and that's not that's not clarified. And that's why, you know, we bring up that if you're under the million dollar threshold and you're about to get there, how do they figure it out? Well, to me, it's I interpret that you would get audited and you would get audited by states to see if you are selling over a million dollars outside of your own state's borders. And if you are selling a million dollars outside of your state's borders, then you can be audited by all of those 45 states 
and tribal lands. And it's also not clarified that the tribal lands would be included into those 45 audit jurisdictions. So we could be looking at the number, I think is like three, was it 500, 600? Okay. Yeah, you're, basically, it, on its face, it's an honor system. So I'm doing, I'm doing business, I cross over that million dollar threshold, then yes, I suddenly have to begin collecting and remitting. However, if I'm at $980,000, state auditors can suddenly say, prove to me, prove to me that you are under that $1 million small seller threshold. And suddenly you're once again faced with the question of, do I just turn over the money or do I want to waste my time and energy and resources fighting this in court? And uh, Mr. Armanda brought up a really good point that Katie and I hadn't fully addressed. One of the amendments to the Senate bill, the manager's amendment, added tribal lands to the list of jurisdictions that can engage in these practices. Now, there are 550 different tribal lands that can now each have their own software, each have their own audits, each have their own tax codes. So on top of the 46, Katie and I have been kind of shorthanding for a while, on top of the 46 different state auditors you might be facing, you add in the 550 tribal lands, you're looking at potentially 600 different audits that you could face monthly, annually, or every couple of years. And that's a big burden, big cost, just for trying to sell your goods online or through a catalog. Well, it's, it's not that much of a revenue source. It's not, it does not respect federalism. It's not a sustainable revenue source. And when you look at something like um, Governor McDonald's transportation plan, and you go from 5% uh, sales tax, they get rid of the gas tax, and they say, okay, it's gonna be 5.3 for most of the state except for Northern Virginia, it's gonna be six, and Hampton Roads is gonna be 6%. Um, However, if marketplace fairness doesn't pass, everybody's sales tax is gonna go up. It's kind of like a, a strong arming for this revenue. And then you look at the estimates and how much, um, there's actually an article on Americans for Tax Reform website about how the numbers aren't clear. And so they talk about saying, oh, you know, well, we're saving money in transportation costs. But when you look at the overall bill, it's actually a, for Virginia, $5.3 million, $5 million tax increase. And again, with um, Maryland, they followed suit. It's a $4.4 .4 million tax increase. So you're looking at these where they say, oh, well, we're saving you money over here by doing this, but really they're not because overall it is a tax increase. And then when you look at what their revenue numbers are going forward, it actually changes from bill plan to bill plan. So when they weren't collecting online sales tax in Virginia, they were actually bringing in more new revenue than they were after they included online sales tax. So there's a lot of guesswork going on here. And so we know that states really don't know how much revenue new taxes would come from this type of legislation. And they think it's a lot more than it will be. And, and it does ultimately come down to a state's rights issue. States have the right to protect their own businesses from tax collectors in other states. So if, let's say, I am a Virginia resident and I own a business in Virginia and Virginia decides to not join the MFA, there is nothing to protect my Virginia business from a California tax collector. There is nothing. States lose the right to protect their own businesses. And states that choose a 0% tax rate lose the right to protect their businesses from having to create a new tax collection system and learn how to actually implement tax collection processes. So states lose the rights to protect their own businesses. And the heart of conservatism is states' rights and the ability of states to protect their citizens from other states and from the national government. So that's the heart of conservatism. To use a very public governor who 
conservative governor who has come out in favor, Chris Christie, I think once this actually goes into effect, he will not see that much new revenue coming to New Jersey because guess what? Amazon will begin collecting in New Jersey later this year. So already 10 of the top e-retailers will be collecting for the state of New Jersey. That's the thing. A lot of these governors have been convinced that this is a silver bullet to their problems, and it's really not. And I would ask them to weigh that against the cost of the loss of the right to protect their businesses. Right, and again, if you're looking at you know state governors, the again, as I pointed out earlier, we're looking at setting a precedent. Right, it's not about sales tax collection. It's about what can I tax later. It's about setting the precedent to go after business income activity. Um, I mean, we already know of instances where states are trying to do this, or they're trying to establish some kind of presence so that they can tax. And once they have this set up, it's a precedent to continue to tax other other rev revenue streams. Right, and, and I think if the past couple of weeks have taught us anything, we shouldn't necessarily put all of our faith in tax collectors, so. Okay. so one last question, in the back. Yeah, <laughs> good name too. So speaking for trust, which is the true simplification of taxation coalition, if all 12 of the minimum simplifications that are on that sheet actually make it into the bill, of which I think there's one right now, then yes, that's something trust could get behind. But I will let Heritage uh, speak for themselves on. on our, our concern with the bill is that the first point that I made back in the introduction, that this violates federalism. And because it violates federalism, we're not going to support any we're not going to think it's good policy. There's no changes to the bill that could make it good policy. Uh, that violation of federalism is. So no of as long as the bill we determine the bill violates federalism, we're not going to we're not going to believe it's good policy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. First. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, use taxes on the books, and if it's there, you know, it's there. I think states can educate their constituents, and you know, make sure that they know that this is something they owe to at least estimate what they owe on online sales when they're doing their tax returns. But uh, Adriel, to, to answer your question, the good news is, Adriel. sorry, Adriel, Adriel, the good news is that this is a problem that's solving itself. 93% of all e-commerce is done by the top 500 e-retailers, of which over 70% is done by the top 50. And as I said earlier, 17 of the top 20 already collect for every single state. Uh, one such example would be Walmart.com, which collects for every single state in the country. Not because Walmart.com is some 
philanthropic organization that wants to do good and collect sales tax, it's because they have stores in every single state in the country, and they therefore have physical presence. Well, the other good news is that Amazon is now collect, by the end of the year, will be collecting for over half the country. And as they move to same-day delivery to compete with the brick-and-click model of bestbuy.com, target.com, and walmart.com, they will be opening more and more distribution centers across the country and will eventually be collecting for most all of the country. So in the end, this is really a solution in search of a problem because the problem of uncollected sales tax is solving itself. Right, and we haven't brought up you know, business to business sales either. I believe it's 98% of business to business online sales are collected in every single state. And so that's another you know, area where the problem has already been solved, where physical presence and you know, as these businesses grow, they begin to collect in more and more states. So, I mean, I would agree that it is, it's a solution in search of a problem. And, and the little guys were actually having trouble even before internet sales really went through the roof. And they're having trouble because you started seeing companies that can engage in economies of scale mm -hmm. and push prices way, way down. So the Main Street store, which can't really dictate the price of a stereo to the stereo manufacturer the way that a big store with huge economies of scale can, is subject to compete with lower prices at a nearby store. And that's just, that's, just, that's just commerce, and there's nothing wrong with that. So, Well, and that's why, you know, we believe that as with the, um, the E-Main Street Alliance that E-Main Street and physical Main Street aren't really at odds. I mean, they're, they are on the same, they're on the same page. Right, and, and as I said, the great opportunities for those boutique stores in small, small cities the internet is really one of the best and last opportunities for them to reach new customers who would never walk down Main Street. So it, it's a shame that, that the conversation's been framed as internet versus Main Street, right. because the internet is really a tool of Main Street. And anyone who's ever shopped on Etsy knows that they have such wonderful items from unique sellers and mothers staying at home and fathers staying at home who are handcrafting items Mm -hmm. who could otherwise never find somebody to buy their high-priced items. Thanks for that question. You raised some very important points and did a very nice job answering them. Do you have any, any um, statements to, to wrap up, or anything that you might have missed before we close, the, close it out? Okay. All right. Well, please keep in mind that we videotaped the event and we'll put it on our blog either later today or tomorrow. So if you missed anything, please uh, check it out there and send it to those who couldn't make it with us today. And let's thank Katie and Carl for the wonderful job they did. They were a font of information.